Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Diane Sykes, Judge Sykes from the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals in Chicago, and I'm very pleased to be with you this afternoon for this uh, final panel of this year's Federalist Society Convention. Our, our topic this afternoon is ideas for structural change. Um, this is kind of a, a big umbrella topic, and it could be somewhat theoretical and abstract um, in its scope um, and particulars, but our panelists will attempt to make it both concrete and practical and place it within the broader conference themes of controlling government and maintaining fidelity to the constitutional design. In a political year that has seen the rise of the Tea Party and a remarkable degree of popular interest in limited constitutionalism, we have seen some sweeping proposals for structural change advanced in the political debate, ranging from proposals to repeal the 16th and 17th Amendments to more general federalism restoring measures. Earmark reform has a pretty strong political wind at its back, and the issue of term limits has returned, and legislative restrictions on lame duck lawmaking have been proposed. Structural constitutional challenges to the health care reform bill are now making their way through the lower courts. And some recent Supreme Court cases have structural implications for the federal state balance in our liability system and for the authority and accountability within the executive branch. And because this um, is such a big sort of umbrella topic, our approach this afternoon will be topical, so a little bit different than the usual Federalist Society panel discussions. We have assembled five distinguished lawyers here with us this afternoon to discuss and debate some of these developments and proposals. On my far right at the end of the table is Professor Lillian Bevere. She is, of course, well known to many of you. She's always generous with her time and characteristically thoughtful in advancing the debates at these Federalist Society events. She is the David and Mary Harrison Distinguished Professor Emeritus at the University of Virginia Law School. She has taught and written widely, but her principal contributions for our purposes this afternoon have been in the field of constitutional law. Seated next to her is Patrick McSweeney. Mr. McSweeney has been practicing law for more than 40 years, concentrating in civil litigation, including constitutional challenges in both the state and federal courts. He is currently a legal advisor to the Virginia Tea Party Patriots Federation and has previously served in several legal advisory positions in Virginia state government. On my left, uh, near left, Douglas Kendall is a litigator, author, and progressive activist. He is the founder and president of the Constitutional Accountability Center, the successor to the Community Rights Council. That is a progressive constitutional think tank and public interest law firm that I think many of you are acquainted with. He has co-authored many briefs in the United States Supreme Court, most recently an amicus in McDonald versus the city of Chicago, and his commentary frequently appears on network and cable news and in the opinion columns of national newspapers and magazines. On my right, Gibson Vance is a seasoned civil litigator at the Beasley Allen Law Firm in Montgomery, Alabama. He has handled dozens of jury trials, many resulting in large verdicts for his clients. He has been active in the American Association for Justice, formerly known as the American Association of Trial Lawyers, and is currently the president of that organization. And on my far left is Michael Carvin, a partner at Jones Day here in Washington, D.C., and uh, he focuses in his practice at Jones Day on constitutional appellate civil rights and civil litigation against the federal government. He previously served in senior positions in the Office of Legal Counsel and in the Civil Rights Division in the Department of Justice. He has argued dozens of cases in the United States Supreme Court, most recently Free Enterprise Fund versus Public Ac Company Accounting Oversight Board, and he will discuss that case, among other things, with us here this afternoon. He was also a lead counsel and handled the argument in the Florida Supreme Court on behalf of George W. Bush during the Florida recount controversy. I think, um, if memory serves, that was the, the losing phase of that litigation. <laughs> <laughs> you, were, you were vindicated. <laughs> we viewed it as a bump on the road. I didn't know. Speed bump, okay. Please. Speed bump. Um, our first issue for this afternoon is, um, generally speaking, uh, proposals for changing congressional incentives and enhancing congressional accountability. And Professor Bevere will lead us off. Thank you, Judge Sykes. 
Um, it's nice to see so many of you here, and I, I think this is really probably the best way to spend a Saturday afternoon, especially when the weather is nice. So we appreciate your being with us. Um, I live in Charlottesville, which is in the 5th District of Virginia, which was represented for one disastrous term by Tom Periello. Uh, the race in the 5th District attracted a lot of national attention. You've probably even heard Tom Periello's name. It was a major, major must-win for the Democrats. Um, Periello was a favorite of the mainstream media, seemed to be. There was a flattering portrait of him in the New Yorker magazine, for example. His campaign attracted more than three million dollars in contributions, and uh, not all of those were from Charlottesville people. Um, and President Obama uh, spent what he had left of his political capital on the Friday before the election by coming to Charlottesville and having a great event. Um, Periello lost. So you might be wondering, why I'm taking any of my time at all to talk about him. And the reason is that um, wholly, wholly without meaning to, I'm quite certain, uh, he made a statement during the campaign that uh, sums up much of what I want to talk to you about today. Um, Unless you stop us, he said, we're just going to keep stealing from you. Well, if you're not doing a double take right now, I don't know, you really need to be someplace else because you're not paying attention. He said he's a Democrat. If you don't keep, if you don't keep, if you don't stop us, we're just going to keep stealing from you. Well, I think that's what I want to talk about is ways to keep them from stealing from us, both our money and our freedom. Uh, I'm going to just offer a couple of real baby steps toward structural reform. I think it was baby steps that got us where we are today with the structural distortions that we presently observe. And I think it will be perhaps baby steps that it will at least begin us on the path to uh, structural uh, reform back to our uh, constitutional structural foundation. So here's my basic thesis. My premise is that lawmakers want to get reelected. I don't think this is news to anybody. Um, but what many of their constituents want lawmakers to do is to vote for measures that will reduce the size of government and the scope of government. Now the problem is that the incentives that presently confront individual legislators are systematically perverse from the point of view of uh, shrinking the government. Um, in large part, I think this is because of the way the lawmaking process has been structured. Admittedly, it's been structured this way by the lawmakers themselves. Instead of being transparent, the process is impermeable, opaque. Instead of accountability, the process permits almost complete irresponsibility. Earmarks permit lawmakers to get credit from their constituents for irresponsible spending in their districts, Omnibus appropriations bills permit them to escape blame for contribution to the ballooning deficit. So as a first step to limiting the size and power of government, I suggest that what's needed is for Congress to erect some procedural roadblocks on itself that will make it harder, much harder, for it to grow government and at the same time will make it easier for us as citizens to know what they are doing and to hold them accountable for doing it. Because here's an interesting fact. Uh, I shouldn't say it's a fact. It's a theory. Um, it's a, th a theory that has emerged from the academic study of agency costs in corporate law. Agency costs are costs that principals, owners, constituents incur when they have to hire someone other than themselves to act on their behalf. Principals hire agents, owners hire managers, citizens hire legislators. The theory, the agency cost theory, is that agents have a tendency, like all self-interested people, to want to maximize their own welfare instead of the welfare of their principles. Put in our context, the theory says that legislators have a tendency to maximize their own welfare uh, instead of that of their constituents. And the more they think they can get away with that without getting fired, by finding one way or another to hide or disguise what they're doing, the more they will do it. And they will keep doing it. They will keep maximizing their own welfare instead of their constituents' welfare. And they will keep doing it and doing it and doing it until their constituents finally say, in despair, enough. 
So a first step to fixing what's, what's gotten broken is for Congress to enact rules for itself that will make it harder, that will make it personally more costly for them to grow government and spend our money. Rules that will make what they're doing more transparent so that they will know that they are being watched and that therefore they will be less inclined to misbehave and we will be more able to hold them accountable for what they do. Transparency and accountability. Increase those and you've made a beginning at effecting structural change. By the way, I think it's very important to be quite clear that when I speak of structural change, I think of a structural change that returns us to the original structure that the framers had in mind. I don't want to change the structure that the framers adopted. I want to return to it. So that's when I speak of structural change. I think that applies to most of us here. I thought that might be an applause line. <laughs> I've got two particular reforms in mind. One is already in the works and seems miraculously close to becoming a reality, at least on paper. That's earmark reform. Uh, the other change, in my view, is very much worth considering, and that's the, a single subject or germa and germaneness requirement for legislation. Legislate one topic at a time, with every provision in the legislation required to be germane to that particular subject. Now, earmarks. Mostly they've been talked about in terms of their impact on the budget. But the, fact, uh, but the fact that they increase spending over what it might otherwise be um, is not by any means their only, nor indeed their most perverse or pernicious effect. The reason earmarks are bad is that their availability distorts the incentives of legislators in ways that are really, truly perverse. Why should the representative from North Dakota vote for what seems to her to be a waste of taxpayer funds for highway construction or a bridge or a community health center or what have you in New Jersey? What good will that do for the people of North Dakota? Well, earmarks are a reason, along with the good old game of you scratch my back and I'll scratch yours, uh, for the North Dakota representative to vote for the bridge in New Jersey. You vote for my earmark in New Jersey, and I'll vote for your new library in Fargo. And maybe you can even name it after yourself, or your father, if you've only been in Congress for one term. Mm -hmm. uh, all the players in this log rolling game uh, think that they are winners. They get federal money for their districts, and they can claim credit for the project, and thereby enhance their chances of getting reelected. Now, I'd like to suggest that there are two important questions that every federal legislator ought to ask about every federal spending program. First, is this something that is needed and that only government can provide? In other words, it cannot be funded by private enterprise, um, by the private sector. And second, is this something that the federal government should be spending money on, or should it be left to the states or to local government? I think it's a pretty fair bet that a lot of the projects, maybe 90, 99% of the projects financed with earmark money, would not pass a straight face application of either the test of fulfilling a need that only government can supply, or the test of being a need that only federal money can fulfill. So earmarks are bad, not just because they result in too much government spending by the wrong government for things that no government ought to spend taxpayer dollars on. They're also bad because they encourage lawmakers to think about the wrong things and to vote for the wrong reasons when they vote on appropriations bills. In other words, again, they, dis they perversely distort the incentives of legislators to the detriment of the constituents of all of them. So now to the single subject germaneness requirement. We're all familiar with the omnibus appropriations bills that have become the all too common norm in recent years. Where all the appropriations for all the departments, which of course includes uh, most of the important policy initiatives, are bundled into one humongous bill. And sub uh, longer even than the healthcare bill or the Dodd-Frank bill. This is submitted to an up or down vote, usually under the gun of some sort of deadline or other, such as we're gonna cut off funding for the war in Afghanistan and shut down the federal government at the same time. So there's something in, in these monstrosities for everyone. Of course there is. That's the point. And anyone, any congressperson or senator, can justify a vote for the bill, even though they wouldn't have voted for 99 one-hundredths of 
the um, provisions that are contained in it had those 99 each been presented to them in a single piece of legislation. But they can justify their vote for the bill because A, it contains at least one provision that they would have voted for standing alone, and B, uh, everyone will say the same thing. There is at least one provision in this omnibus bill that I think would make good law and good policy. So in addition to that fact, these bills are presented on an all or nothing basis. No one's going to blame any one legislator if it passes. So why would any one legislator stand up and fight it? These humongous bills make it virtually impossible for constituents to know what their representatives are doing. And because they render the, their output so opaque, they render government that much less accountable. A single subject rule to the effect that, a, that each separate bill could cover only one subject, coupled with a rule that each provision must be germane to that subject, would go a long way, I think, to rendering the legislative process more transparent. And by doing so, it would help to make legislators more accountable. Subject by subject, vote by vote, their constituents would be able to track their behavior. No longer would they be able to hide behind the shield of omnibus appropriations bills to justify voting funds for projects and poli policy initiatives that neither they nor their constituents really want or really support. There's one thing a single subject or germaneness rule might not be able to accomplish, and that's something for which I really don't have a remedy. I just want to point it out, and hopefully somebody will have a way of fixing this. And that is Congress's practice of disguising efforts at redistributing income or resources as mere regulation, or even worse, as reform, with quotes around the reform word, uh, because reform in this context is a misnomer if there ever was one. The health care legislation is a vivid example of this. It's probably a fair guess that anyone that knows anything about health care delivery in this country knows that there are ways it could be gen genuinely reformed so as to deliver more and better care more efficiently to more people. But to acknowledge the need for or desirability of reform is not, is not, is not to endorse the health care legislation that Congress passed. Did you hear me? Uh, and among the many reasons I say this is that the legislation is as much about redistribution of health care resources as it is about general, genuine reform of health care delivery. Thank you. Um, Don Berwick, who's the recess appointed uh, head of Medicare, has been very explicit about this, and I think he needs to be taken at his word. The problem with doing things this way, with packaging uh, redistribution as substantive reform, is that what you end up with is reform that isn't reform because it creates as many inefficiencies as it claims to eliminate, and redistribution that makes those at the top much worse off while not doing anywhere near enough for those at the bottom. In other words, it achieves the worst of both worlds. Thank you. All right, before we move to some rebuttal on that, Pat McSweeney has some observations on structural reforms directed at the Congress um, from the perspective of the Virginia Tea Party Patriots, but also um, from an individual perspective. Pat. Thank you. I try not to uh, go over the territory that uh, Professor Bevere has already gone over. Uh, I concur in just about everything she said. Uh, I want to first say something about the Tea Party movement. It's, uh, it's not a monolithic organization, as you probably know. In fact, in, uh, in some cities, we have a multiplicity of organizations. But one thing I, I find that uh, all of the people in the movement agree upon is we have a dire problem. We're about to go over a cliff, perhaps within the next decade. We're spending at a rate that uh, results in a deficit that amounts to one-tenth or approximating one-tenth of our economy annually. And anyone knows that's unsustainable. When I shared uh, the program this weekend or this week with some of the Tea Party leaders in Virginia, they felt that it didn't address that problem. We have a grave problem. We're about to expire, and we're playing around the edges. Uh, I don't mean my words to offend, but <clears throat> I have to ask the question, if the problem is that great, 
Is anyone in Washington truly, genuinely interested in deep reform? And I worked here at a time when we were interested in reform and an old management uh, proverb is you manage when you're in control. You don't bring management control when you're out of control. Well, we're out of control right now. I debated uh, with a number of um, opponents the balanced budget amendment that we drafted in the early 70s. Uh, and we proposed the Legislative Budget and Executive Impoundment Control Act in 1973 became the act uh, that was somewhat modified in 74. We thought that was going to deal with earmarks and all the rest, and obviously it didn't. Uh, one of the problems is the culture of Washington. Even with structural reform, and I go back to the debates, uh, particularly the Virginia ratification debates, when Madison had to concur that reform organization itself is not the answer. It has to be a combination of a change in organization and a change in culture. Uh, we have a lot of things that can be done, but quite frankly, they could easily be nullified by five votes on the Supreme Court. And it was not the contemplation of the founders that on federal state matters, the Supreme Court would have the final say, which led, of course, to the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions and ultimately to a civil war, if not uh, a number of other nullification efforts and threats in the intervening period. One of the difficulties in the Tea Party movement is holding back those people who want to return to nullification because they quite frankly don't believe that reform is going to come from Washington and it's a grave threat, I think. To make it happen uh, at a time when I, I see no perceptible indication that that word has gotten through to Washington. Uh, I left here 37 years ago thinking that uh, uh, Virginia might lend some lessons to Washington. And much to my chagrin, the way of Washington has crept into Virginia. We have short sessions. The longer of the two is 60 days. Short session is about a week or 10 days shorter than that on average. Some people are still annoyed that we have annual sessions. We also have, as almost every state does, a constitutional requirement that we not borrow from year to year beyond to pay for the ongoing needs, operational budget of the state. In other words, a balanced budget requirement is built into our Constitution. All of those things would be wonderful if we could just bring them to Washington. Instead, in 2007, um, a gentleman who happened to be of a uh, nominally conservative bent from the Republican administration introduced the idea of an omnibus bill the first time in uh, Virginia. We challenged that bill on a number of fronts. Uh, I challenged it in the Virginia Supreme Court ultimately, and we won on one proposition, which was that the General Assembly could not delegate its legislative power to impose taxes on an unelected body which we thought was ele elemental truth, uh, particularly since we fought a revolution 220 years ago on that very proposition. Uh, but one challenge failed and it bothered me and it still bothers me. And that was a challenge under our single, what we call a single object rule, the single subject or one object rule. Most states have such a provision. Unanimously, the court ruled in our favor on the unelected uh, taxing authority but ruled against us unanimously on our challenge based on single object rule. The difficulty is coming up with a formula that can be readily applied by judges. Uh, what I'm coming down to is this is something I think has to be imposed as a matter of self-discipline, self-restraint by legislators themselves, and that's going to be hard to come by. If you can come up with a phrase, in the case of the 2007 legislation, it was one word, transportation. Now, everything at some point in life comes in touch with transportation. Everything from funding ornamental uh, uh, and landscape uh, uh, farming to increasing the salaries of uh, university professors were all thrown into this omnibus bill, and yet it was sustained on a challenge that it violated the single object rule. Uh, if we could do anything, to start reversing what I think is unsustainable spending and growth and debt, it would be in Congress itself, and not that it's just symbolic. When I left here 37 years ago, 
the complement, the congressional staff complement, was about a third of what it is now. We increased it after the Watergate uh, experience, thinking that we needed more subcommittees for oversight. Well, what terrible fate would befall the United States if we cut it back to where it was in 1974? I suspect it would improve things. I'm uh, naive enough to believe if we required sessions to be shortened and send legislators home, a certain amount of humility might return to our, legislated, uh, our elected legislators. Those two things, uh, I think, would be providential. I don't think they're going to happen anytime soon. I don't see the self-discipline uh, being uh, suddenly uh, overrunning uh, the halls of Congress. But if something isn't done, it will be in defiance, it will be an exhibit of willful blindness because, again, returning to the character of the Tea Parties, they're of all stripes. Now, most of them tend to be older, which surprises me because the greatest intergenerational inequity in the history of the world has been visited on my children and grandchildren by my generation, I'm not a boomer, and by the boomers. And yet young people are the least likely to participate in this Tea Party movement. The reason it's going to be sustained is that for the first time in the lives of many, including political science students I taught, they honestly believe, they genuinely feel, that they have some role to play in government. I taught um, third and fourth year students um, political science, and in the fall I would have them all to my office on election night. Many of them didn't vote. These are political science majors, and I asked why. First response is they all lie. What's the point? The deeper problem was, I'm one of 350 million. What difference does it make? This is the most profound change that's come to our political culture in my lifetime. People now have a feeling that their participation, although it may not have been, may have been meager or non-existent in the past, matters, and that they are very concerned about what they're leaving their children and grandchildren. And if Washington doesn't hear it, I think we are going to reach a point where those folks in the Tea Party movement that want more drastic measures are going to have their way. I don't see that that word is getting across yet, although there are a number of new members who may have their voices heard. The, uh, the other problem I see with some of the structural changes uh, is that there's a double bind. I've, I've always favored earmark control, if not elimination. The problem comes with the corresponding power that's given over to the executive branch. I know you've heard some, most notably Ron Paul argues that we haven't dealt with the underlying problem. We haven't curbed spending. We've simply let the uh, executive have more power. Term limits is another double bind. If we limit legislators, uh, many commentators across the political spectrum point out that that will give bureaucrats even more control because we'll have less oversight. We'll have less uh, institutional memory in the minds of the legislators themselves. If we reduce the staff, we have the same problem. Uh, <clears throat> no step we take will not come without some corresponding problem. A particular uh, problem, I think, is the term limits uh, proposal, which I don't think is ever going to get anywhere because the the public has not been aroused enough by what's happened to turn to term limits as a solution. I do think they've turned to earmark control as a solution. But one of the things we, we tried to do in the Legislative Budget and Executive Empowerment Act back in 73 was to focus the entire Congress on the overall picture because we were being nibbled to death by a flock of ducks. Every special, special interest was getting what it wanted and the sum total was far more than we could afford. I uh, wish that we could be back in 1973-74 when you compare the conditions we face now with, uh, with that period. The problem is that <clears throat> without self-discipline on the part of the legislators themselves, we're always going to have that problem play out in some way. I don't see how we can formulate a formal rule that requires germaneness because of the, the games that can be played with words. Ultimately, it comes back to accountability, and that's where I, I do share Professor Bevere's concern. We should do everything possible to shorten the distance between 
the voters and elected officials. And we all know that many of the devices used over the past century, for example, the creation of independent regulatory agencies, was to avoid accountability. The last thing legislators want is a clear issue dropped back on their laps. They want it fuzzed up and in a, an independent body that they're not responsible for. That goes on in a multiplicity of ways in Washington. And every effort should be made to streamline the decision making so the voters can understand precisely what's done and who's responsible. Because ultimately, if we don't do it at the ballot box, all these structural reforms will mean nothing. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Pat. And now for a little different take on this issue, Doug Kendall. Uh, thank you, and, uh, and thanks for coming. When, when Dean Reuter suggested on our call that there would be 200 people on a Saturday afternoon at 2.30 for a panel on structural change, my one reaction was, that's why you're winning. Um, <laughs> and I think that's still the case. Um, Constitutional Accountability Center, um, is an organization launched in 2008 dedicated to the progressive promise of the Constitution's text and history. We are started to shake up the debate about the Constitution in this country. Uh, we think that justices like Clarence Thomas and Antonin Scalia are exactly right in taking the Constitution's text and history deeply seriously and often deeply wrong about what the Constitution's text and history require. We think that the argument between conservatives and progressives is not the silly one about whether the Constitution is living or dead, but rather whether we should go back to the Constitution as crafted by our founders or whether we should, we should respect the Constitution that we have today as amended by uh, brave Americans over the last 220 years. And I have to say on that respect, um, both the Tea Party and Justice Scalia recently are playing into our hands by suggesting that we should um, repeal portions of the Constitution and particularly parts of the amendments. Um, listening to this debate, I, I just want to make two points, hopefully pretty quickly. Um, the first is res a response to um, Prof Professor Bevere and uh, Mr. McSweeney and kind of the entire thrust of the conference uh, devoted to um, the Tea Party and controlling government. I think it's deeply wrong and ahistoric to suggest that the framers and ratifiers of the Constitution we have today would object to efforts by the federal government to solve national problems like health care. The second point I'd make, I'll make is um, that I think the premise that our modern political problems stem from Congress doing too much is also flawed. I think rather the current use of filibusters in the United States Senate now requires a supermajority for any legislation, whether it's to create a bigger or a smaller government. I think the unpopularity of our politicians today in both parties stems in large measure from the facts that we keep throwing the bums out, bringing new bums in, and the bums can't do anything and can't do what they want and were sent to Washington to do. I think there's a surprisingly strong case to be made that the de facto supermajority for, legisla for legislation mandated by the current system of holds and filibusters is inconsistent with our constitutional structure laid down by the framers. And I think if we're talking about structural reforms that might improve our political system, we should think seriously about filibuster reform. Okay, so let me start with the argument, which is really the central argument of this panel and this convention, which goes something like this. The federal government has grown far beyond the government imagined by the framers and is now addressing topics like health care that are not within the federal government's enumerated powers. We're definitely not going to resolve that debate here, but let me just tick off six little facts that I think show that is deeply flawed. The first was that con the Constitutional Convention itself was held to create a stronger federal government that could address the nation's geostrategic and commercial needs. Second, 
The convention established a federal government with powers to address problems where the states were separately incomp incompetent. The convention instructed the Committee of Detail, which crafted Artic or Article 1, that Congress was to enjoy, and this is a quote, was to enjoy authority to, quote, legislate in all cases for the general interest of the Union, and also in those cases to which the states are separately incompetent, or in which the harmony of the United States may be interrupted by the exercise of individual legislation. That is a remarkably broad conception of the national government's power. Third, at least some of our founding fathers, most notably Alexander Hamilton and George Washington, wanted a very energetic and powerful federal government. And Hamilton largely got his way in the Washington administration and in the Marshall Supreme Court in a series of rulings such as McCullough and Gibbons versus Ogden. Fourth, we fought a bloody civil war about the division of federal and state powers, and the Union prevailed. Subsequently, we passed three amendments that shifted vast authority to the federal government. Fifth, in the Progressive Era, we passed two more amendments. The 16th, which provided for a federal income tax and provided vast new resources to the federal government. And the 17th Amendment, which took a key piece of leverage, a selection of senators, away from the states. Finally, in the 1930s, the nation plunged in to a, an economic depression that is unimaginable to modern Americans. Rightly or wrongly, government, action, government inaction was blamed for this crisis, and government action enabled, enabled by the rulings of the Roosevelt Court is credited for turning the country around. Now, we can disagree about aspects of this, but I think that story, that story of how our Constitution was founded and how the powers of the federal government have been expanded over the last 220 years is why I think, at least until very recently, the idea that the federal government had the power to address national problems has not been all that controversial. I think that in light of this history, the, the argument that the uh, government lacks the power to do things like fix the health care system is remarkably weak, which is why conservatives like Charles Freed and Gene Volek have come out so strongly against those arguments. Um, as I indicated before, I don't think the problem is necessarily that Congress is overreaching. I think the bigger problem is that neither party can right now accomplish what the voters send them to Washington to do. Members of the Federalist Society saw this first when Democrats in Congress used the, decided to use a filibuster to block a handful of President Bush's judicial nominees. Well, holds and filibusters are now blocking floor votes for even the most uncontroversial of President Obama's judicial nominees. The number of filibusters broadly has increased exponentially in recent years. Between 1985 and 2006, the number of cloture motions increased gradually from 40 to 68. And then they exploded in 2007 and 2008 to a total of 139, a number that will probably increase by the time this congressional session is over. It has become the case that nothing major can pass the United States Senate without a supermajority vote in the United States Senate. And put that way, the case for the unconstitutionality of the routine Senate filibusters is surprisingly strong. Our founders were pretty precise. Where they wanted a supermajority requirement, they created one. And they did so sparingly because, as Hamilton explains in Federalist 75, it has been shown that all provisions which require more than a majority of any body to its resolutions have a direct tendency to embarrass the operations of the government and an indirect one to subject the sense of the majority to that of the minority. We should also think about poor Joe Biden. The Constitution gives Joe one and only thing to do on a regular basis, and that is to serve as a president of the Senate and to break ties when the Senate is equally divided. Well, the filibuster makes such ties totally irrelevant. It takes 60 votes, not 51, to do anything. So Joe's 
warm bucket of spit job has become even warmer and even spittier. Um, and while it is certainly the case that the Senate has the ability to set up its rules of its proceedings, it also has a duty under the Constitution to do so in harmony with the rest of the Constitution. Arguably, the filibuster rule, in conjunction with the requirement that it takes 67 votes to change Senate rules, is out of keeping with that requirement. So if we're serious about structural change that will improve the functioning of our constitutional system, I think filibuster reform should be at or near the top of our list. Thank you, Doug. Before I go back to Professor uh, Bevere to engage on some of those um, points of disagreement that you mentioned, um, I wanted to give Mike a chance. Did you want to chime in here? Fine. Okay. Professor Bevere. Um, I, I don't want to say um, much about what uh, Mr. McSweeney had to say because I'm afraid that I sort of agree with him, and that scares the living bejeebers out of me, to be, to be honest. Um, I choose to be slightly more hopeful of, sh of the possibility of short-term baby steps. Um, I, I may be fooling myself and trying to fool you at the same time, but um, that's kind of where I am at the moment. With respect to the filibuster, you know, I just, I just don't know. When I look at the incentives, by the way, the, the great words of the of progressives when they address um, conservative arguments is that the conservative arguments are deeply flawed and that's deeply flawed is um, it's just the lingo that says you're full of you know whatever <laughs> but in a very nice way <laughs> <laughs> I don't think yours are deeply flawed I just think they're probably wrong um, the, the filibuster, I think, is, an, is a very interesting um, thing to, to take on, but more importantly, if you want to talk about um, impediments to majority rule, if you want to, to talk about that, I think the, the system of holes that senators have, individual senators have, um, that can stop nominees from coming to uh, the floor or is uh, much more troublesome because those are completely non-transparent and they can be done at whim. And so I think that's a, that's a real problem. I doubt very much that the Senate is going to be willing to give itself, to, to take that away from its members. The filibuster, I'm not so sure about. Sometimes you win with the filibuster, sometimes you lose with the filibuster. Um, I thought that there was a filibuster-proof Senate for the last two years, but I don't know what happened if we're still worried about filibuster. Um, it seems that it wasn't the filibuster that impeded progressive social change. I don't think that much did impede progressive social change is the problem. But, but the fil you know, I think that in the Constitution, I'll just say kind of my impression of it is that it does have significant impediments to getting legislative legislation passed. Of course, there's plenty of power in the federal government to, to resolve some major national problems, and there's supposed to be, but it's also supposed, especially when I look at the incentives of legislators now, which is to legislate more and spend more money, I'm just really happy for any impediment to them proceeding with the agenda that they might have in mind. I, I think that's a kind of, um, I'm not pleased with myself for coming down that way because it seems rather that just kind of anything that says stop is better than uh, something that says, oh, go ahead and, and pass what it is you want to pass. So that's, it's not a principled argument. It's, it's, a, it's an argument of just having observed what the Senate does and not being real, real happy with it. All right, thank you. Do you want a, a last word on this subject before we go to issue two? All right, our issue two for the afternoon, um, I have under the uh, basic caption of assaults on the Seventh Amendment or not. Um, Gibson Vance is here to talk about uh, the Supreme Court's cases in Iqbal and Twombly, the pleading standards cases, uh, preemption doctrine and um, arbitration doctrine as these decisions of the Supreme Court relate to the federal state balance structurally in our liability system. Gibson. Thank you. Can I have permission to approach the podium? You may. <laughs> Good afternoon. It's a privilege to be here today. I, I greatly appreciate the Federalist Society 
inviting the president of the Trial Lawyers Association to speak. Uh, as Judge Sykes mentioned, I am the president of the American Association for Justice, formerly the Association of Trial Lawyers of America. AAJ is a very unique organization. Many organizations in Washington support various issues, but we care only about one, supporting and defending the Seventh Amendment to the Constitution, the right to a trial by jury. The Seventh Amendment guides every position that we take. The issues that we support, as well as those that we oppose, are all based on their consistency with the spirit and the intent of the Seventh Amendment. We support candidates from all major parties. What we ask them to do is have a principled view of the Seventh Amendment. This includes both Democrats, Republicans, and in the near future, Tea Party members. Uh, Judge Bill Pryor of the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals from Alabama uh, was supported by my law firm and AAJ during his confirmation hearing by the Senate in 2004. Let me be clear, AAJ will support any candidate for Congress that believes in the Seventh Amendment. The right to a trial by jury dates back almost 800 years to the signing of the Magna Carta. Article 39 of the Magna Carta specifically guaranteed the right to jury trials for civil suits and criminal cases. And our founding fathers also agreed with the importance of a trial by jury. James Madison, whose silhouette is the symbol of this organization, stated, in suits at common law, trial by jury in civil cases is as essential to secure the liberty of the people as any one of the preexistent rights of nature. Other founders were equally adamant on the critical importance of access to civil justice. Thomas Jefferson called civil jury trials the only anchor yet ever imagined by man by which the government can be held to the principles of its constitution. But today, that Seventh Amendment right may well be the most ignored and endangered of those enumerated in the Bill of Rights. Years of political and legal warfare by the corporate community in the name of economic efficiency have succeeded in shredding our rights in a host of areas. I'm going to briefly touch on three of those. First, the pre-dispute forced arbitration process found in virtually every consumer and employment contract is often very skewed in the favor of the business and against employees and consumers. AAJ has no qualms with the principle of arbitration, but it should be optional and only after a dispute arises. Pre-dispute mandatory binding arbitration directly endangers the Seventh Amendment. I want to tell you a true story. Recently, my family placed our 98-year-old grandmother in a nursing home. And when we sat down with the administration to fill out the mound of paperwork you have to fill out, the first document they gave us to sign had nothing to do with her health care, had nothing to do with her treatment plan, and even had nothing to do with the cost of her stay at the nursing home. It was a binding forced arbitration agreement where they asked her to waive her right to a trial by jury for any act and any omission, including wrongful death. Certainly, this is not what our forefathers had in mind. Another issue that threatens the sanctity of the Seventh Amendment is federal preemption. A prime example of preemption gone astray is the United States Supreme Court decision of Regal versus Medtronic. The Regal Court said that if a medical device was approved by the FDA, it would no longer be the subject of a state court lawsuit. This is despite the fact that these cases have been allowed for as long as there have been medical devices. In our opinion, this type of decision is best left for individual states. Today, we've seen hundreds of patients with actual physical injury caused by defective and recalled medical devices lose their right to hold device companies accountable. Congress needs to correct the Regal decision and allow the, allow the states to determine what, if any, limit should be placed on these lawsuits. AAJ sees another movement 
within the, within the Supreme Court in the name of judicial economy that is particularly troubling. For more than five decades, the courts have allowed actions to be commenced by something we lawyers call notice pleading. Two recent decisions known as Ashcroft versus Iqbal and Bell Atlantic versus Twomley have severely modified the notice pleading standard, replacing it with a requirement that initial pleadings now need much more specificity. The degree of detail now required in an initial complaint is usually not ascertained until the formal phase of discovery. These decisions have already resulted in the unwarranted dismissal of hundreds of federal cases. The Iqbal and Twomley standard is clearly an impediment to the Seventh Amendment. Perhaps many here today find it unusual that the president of the Trial Lawyers Association would be addressing the Federalist Society. Some may even say, what in the world could AAJ and the Federalist Society ever have in common? But your institution shares very similar principles with AAJ, preserving and promoting individual liberty, personal responsibility, and the rule of law. Politics may try to disguise these commonalities, but nevertheless, our missions intersect more than they diverge. Today, I present a challenge. For those in attendance who support so-called tort reform, Please consider how this conflicts with the principles of limited government you also promote. In many ways, the concept of tort reform is a direct assault on both states' rights and individual freedoms. My ultimate goal as president of AAJ is to raise the profile of the Seventh Amendment. By way of example, Americans universally know that the Second Amendment protects their right to bear arms. But our founding fathers had no intention of making the Second Amendment more or less important than the Seventh Amendment or any other part of the Bill of Rights. It's up to groups like AAJ and the Federalist Society to educate lawmakers, the legal community, and the public at large that we cannot pick and choose which parts of the Constitution to follow and which parts of the Constitution to simply ignore. I'm proud to be a trial lawyer. I'm proud of the work being done by AAJ, and we welcome and appreciate your organization's support of the Seventh Amendment. Once again, I'm honored to be here, and thanks for inviting me. Thank you, Gibson. Uh, before we get some rebuttal on those points, uh, Doug Kendall has some thoughts to add to this subject. Um, yeah, I think juries are an incredibly fascinating subject for anybody who cares about constitutional text and history. Other than uh, Mr. Vance and his organizations, I think Americans by and large fall into one or one of two camps. They either look at the jury system as a little bit antiquated or as in the case of many on the business right, they view the jury system as a dire threat to the American free enterprise system. But to the framers, as Mr. Vance indicated, juries were an absolutely essential institution. If you were at a tea party in 1787, one of the things you would have been clamoring for is more juries because through jury system, through jury service, the founders believed ordinary Americans could participate directly and daily in the functioning of American government. The right to jury in a criminal case is guaranteed in Article III of the Constitution, but that was not nearly enough for the founders. Indeed, one of the main, uh, main, main driving forces towards a Bill of Rights was the fact that the original Constitution didn't guarantee uh, civil juries. And, in, and three of the ten amendments protect juries in some aspect. Despite all that history, and Mr. Vance also indicated some of this, um, even among the Supreme Court's self-professed originalists, there is a really remarkable degree of disdain 
particularly for civil juries. In the regal case that Mr. Uh, Vance talked about, Justice Scalia was aghast at the, sex, at the assertion by Mr. Regal's attorney um, that we needed to preserve the jury verdict in that case. He called it extraordinary, the notion that a, quote, single jury could find a company liable for a de defective product when the scientists at the FDA said it was okay. You know, really, the scientists, those experts, we really got to listen to those. That's not really an argument you hear much from conservative justices, but if it gets rid of the jury, uh, that's okay. It's a remarkable statement and attitude, and you see it, you just saw it again in um, the Williamson case, which was up for the argument. It's, an, it's another preemption case this term, dealing with civil jury trials. Um, and there is an attitude uh, about juries kind of across the court spectrum that is pretty negative. What I think that will, will be fascinating to watch over the next couple of years is what the court does with incorporation issues after the McDonald versus City of Chicago case. My organization, obviously a progressive organization, filed a brief in support of Second Amendment incorporation, actually on behalf of scholars including uh, Steve Calabresi and, and uh, Randy Barnett, but also scholars on the left like Jack Balkan. Um, arguing that the Second Amendment, like other provisions of the Bill of Rights, is incorporated against state action. I don't think that's a conservative position. I don't think it's a liberal position. I think it's the right position, and I think the conservative majority on the court got it right when it found the Second Amendment was incorporated against state action. Um, but now the court will have to face a steady stream of petitions that will ask it to incorporate protections for juries, which now stand among the very few portions of the Bill of Rights that haven't been incorporated against the states. Indeed, right now there's a couple of fascinating petitions to watch, one filed by Gene Volek, the other filed by Jeff Fisher, two very prominent West Coast um, Supreme Court advocates both of which are asking the Supreme Court to uh, overturn a kind of crazy ruling by the court in 1972 in Apodaca versus Oregon, um, which held unsustainably, in my view, that while, state, while jury verdicts in federal criminal cases have to be unanimous, it's okay for jury verdicts in state criminal cases to be non-unanimous. So they upheld a 10 to 2 verdi jury verdict uh, in a state case. This two-tiered system of rights was rejected explicitly by the majority in McDonald, um, and I think it's likely to fall in the near future, perhaps opening the, uh, up the door for another series of cases involving the Seventh Amendment and the grand jury right under the uh, Fifth Amendment. So I think that's just a fascinating area to watch over the next couple of years is what, in the light of McDonald, um, the court does on incorporations of these other other portions of the Bill of Rights. All right, thank you. And we'll have a response on uh, preemption, arbitration, and Iqbal Twombly from Mike Carvin. Right, I begin by saying I obviously agree that uh, in the Seventh Amendment was guaranteed by the Constitution for precisely the reasons that have been articulated to ensure that there's a buffer of the people between the government, the courts, uh, and to ensure that the uh, as in many ways, including the topic I'm going to discuss in a minute, that the people are sovereign and uh, uh, not the government. I don't think that any of the topics that we've discussed are remotely uh, related to or can be fairly characterized as assault on that basic principle. What has happened, uh, I will say first of all, is that circumstances have changed, not that that in any way argues for change in the Constitution, but as I'll point out in a minute, this is really a policy debate. And in terms of the policies that's going on, things have dramatically changed. The, it, at the founding, they never envisioned a class action system which could bankrupt a company. They didn't envision tort laws that assigned uh, 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 grievous punishments without any finding of fault or causation or all, all the modern developments that we've, uh, we've seen in the tort world. So obviously just the threat of a jury trial is not a threat that uh, is not an issue where you're, you're going to be fairly 
a judge in terms of an individualized dispute. It's an enormous club for those because the uh, liability is so extraordinarily disproportionate uh, to the culpability. So in light of that, the court has addressed in various ways uh, things that, again, have nothing to do with the right to have your civil dispute adjudicated by a jury, but involve entirely separate questions. The first one is arbitration. There's nothing in the Constitution spirit text history which suggests that private people can't agree to resolve their disputes outside of the judicial system. They have a basic freedom to say, look, we'd rather do it in a cheap, more efficient, more uh, energetic way, and we actually have a Federal Arbitration Act which gives them, a, uh, which reinforces their right to do it notwithstanding state interference. All of these arbitration cases that were discussed by Gibson simply involve the right of people to agree that we don't want to, particularly when it's a dispute involving $25, submit ourselves to an extraordinarily costly, burdensome litigation. We want to do it in a more effective way. Um, the notion that you have to eliminate that private choice in order to vindicate the private right of adjudication strikes me as a non sequitur. Um, preemption. Preemption is an interesting ideological issue, actually, for people who follow the federal society, because I think Gibson and Douglas would probably agree that probably the most anti-preemption justice on the court today is Clarence Thomas, and that stems from his view that there is two dual spheres of sovereignty with, within uh, the country and that if uh, the Congress wants to take away the rights of states to regulate uh, certain activity in a way that's different from the federal scheme, they, the Congress needs to be uh, pretty explicit in doing that. He does not imply or infer preemption unless uh, Congress says it. Having said that, that's an entirely, uh, that's entirely debate about the supremacy clause. When and under what circumstances federal law trumps state law, state administrative agencies, state others, state decision making, including juries. It has nothing to do with whether or not for the sphere of law left to the states, whether or not those will be adjudicated by juries or, or by courts. So again, it's an interesting populist favored label to say that this is all about the Seventh Amendment, but again, it really has nothing to do with it. It has to do with a bunch of with all respect, Gibson, trial lawyers who are newfound federalists in this one area, and only in this one area, suggesting that states are uh, superior to uh, uniform uh, federal legislation. And finally, we have Iqbal, which has become the bet more of uh, the plaintiff's bar, which, you know, God love him. If it wasn't for them, Jones Day would not be in business. And, uh, I, I, I certainly want to, do not want to in any way deter frivolous and unfounded complaints from being filed and running up millions of dollars in discovery fees, because that's, uh, you know, how we keep the lights on. But the notion... Uh, <laughs> Uh, but the notion that, you know, forcing litigants to actually have some theory of the case before they sue the company, that they don't file complaints and then figure out what wrong they're seeking to vindicate for the millions of people they are trying to organize into a class, strikes me as a bit counterintuitive, as it did the court, which suggests, you know what, you might want to have an injury identified and plausible before you enter into billion dollar lawsuits rather than after. Again, that may well keep these issues away from juries, but only because we do have a system where we want people, as I say, to know what they're complaining about when they're complaining, not after they're complaining. It has nothing to do with the sanctity of individuals adjudicating these cases uh, versus uh, judges. And the same thing goes for tort reform. Hardly an assault on the jury system. No one disputes, I don't think, that the state, the government makes the law and the jury applies it to the facts. All tort reform says is we'd rather have the people's representatives, the legislature, make the rules that govern torts rather than a bunch of sometimes unelected but often uh, insulated from the democratic process judges making this stuff out, out of whole cloth. So we would much rather have a, a system that doesn't give you unlimited liability and unlimited damages for millions of people who haven't really been injured, we'd really rather tie 
tie uh, compensation from one individual to another on a finding that the defendant has actually committed a legal wrong, actually engaged in some negligent behavior, and doesn't have uh, unforeseen liability for unintended consequences. All of that is a way of organizing relationship between people in our society and having some predictable and fair rules. None of it has anything to do with transferring power from 12 good citizens to uh, some unelected judge. Thanks. All right, we're going to keep the crowd pleaser Mike Carvin talking and move <laughs> to issue three this afternoon, which is um, generally under the rubric of separation of powers and executive authority, and he's going to address his case of free enterprise fund and what it means for presidential authority and executive accountability. Well, again, I'll begin by agreeing with both Lillian and uh, uh, Gibson that uh, I think what we've discovered in this uh, structural change panel is that all of us want to not really change what the founders did, but simply enforce their vision. Um, that stems from the not controversial proposition, I don't think, that the framers were probably better about guaranteeing good long-term structural protections than the current American polity, so rather than looking for newfound wisdom among ourselves, why don't we go back, figure out how they had organized the government, these very bright people, and see if we can actually enforce their scheme. The scheme I'd like to talk about is the preservation of separation of powers, most particularly in this case executive power, and explain why, A, that's a very important structural protection that preserves American liberty and the theme I think that uh, both Lillian and Gibson again were talking about, accountability to the people. Um, how that uh, vision had been changed in recent years and how this free enterprise fund case might provide a way of getting back to something along the lines of, uh, of what the framers envisioned. So first, how does separation of powers preserve individual liberty and democratic accountability? This is all, I'm afraid, fifth grade civics class, and you guys will uh, understand it entirely, obviously, which is it separates the powers among the federal government in order to provide ensure that, the, that there's no monopoly on power. Combining the legislative and executive power is the very definition of tyranny, uh, said Madison. But what it really does is ensure, as I said, democratic accountability and ensures that it is not government which is controlling the people, but that the government is subordinate to the people, that all sovereignty ultimately resides in the populace, not in the populace agents in uh, the government. So it works, if you will, in tandem with the Bill of Rights. What the Bill of Rights says, look, there's certain things too important we're just not going to trust to the democratic process, to legislators at all. Congress shall make no law affecting freedom of speech, freedom of religion, and other basic principles that no government can take away from you. But it leaves, of course, an a very wide swath of very controversial policies to the democratic process. Uh, some of which many people would view as destructive or counterproductive. They, government can tax 90% of your income, it can destroy the energy industry to save polar bears in 2100, it can do all kinds of things that people think are uh, misguided. And on the other side of uh, the debate, people would think that climate change legislation is very important for preserving the environment. And the way we ensure popular sovereignty is we ensure that anyone who is making a final decision with respect to that broad range of policy decisions that the Bill of Rights doesn't take out of the democratic process is accountable to the democratic process. You don't want people who are unaccountable to the people making decisions about the people's policies. I don't have to tell the Federalist Society that's why we don't want judges making policy. We want them interpreting the Bill of Rights, not making their own policy. But the framers understood that there was another component of government, the permanent bureaucracy, the executive branch, the people who execute the laws, who also need to be accountable to uh, the populace. Otherwise, of course, you have, you have this definition of tyranny, a government that can impose its will on the people and the people have no ability uh, to alter it. If you didn't like uh, the way the uh, SEC and the Federal Reserve Board handled the financial crisis, and you wanted change that you could believe in, you needed a mechanism to ensure that you could change the policies of the SEC and the Federal Reserve Board. John McCain said during the campaign, I want to fire the chairman of the SEC. And he was informed by the Obama campaign that he couldn't do that. 
And why is that? Because a certain segment of the federal government had been taken outside of the democratic process and outside the purview of change, even if you change the president. So how does separation of powers ensure accountability? It ensures it in two ways, obviously. It tells you who's responsible for what. The legislature is responsible for making laws. The executive is in charge of executing the law. So we know who's responsible for what. And more important, of course, we can do something about it. If we don't like what the president is doing, we can change who the president is through the ballot box. So the ultimate check over the tyranny of the executive is the people's ability to change the executive. Well, how do you reinstall this tyranny? How do you reinstall this notion that the government can control the people? Well, let me tell you first how the, the framers preserved it. Obviously, they preserved it. The only person in the executive branch who stands for election in front of the people is the president. So all of the executive power, not part of it, all of it, the executive power was given to the president. They rejected suggestions for privy council. They rejected suggestions for somehow a shared executive power. It was all resided in the chief executive. And since all of the power resided in the chief executive, obviously if you didn't like what that chief executive was doing, you had the ability to change him and change his uh, policies. Equally, obviously, the president himself can't execute all the laws by himself, even at the time of the founding, much less given all the new responsibilities that the federal government has assumed. So the only way the president can control execution of law is by ensuring that those who execute the law are his people, his team. He's got to control them. He controls them the same way every employer controls every other employer. Employee. He's got to be able to hire them, he's got to be able to fire them, he's got to be able to control their budget, he's got to be able to review their work. If he can't do that, then he can't control the people who are executing the laws of the United States against the citizenry. And if he, and if he is not controlling the people who are executing the laws, then the people have no ability to change um, what happens. You can't change the course of financial regulation. If Ben Bernanke stays on as chairman of the Federal Reserve and you want to get a new change in that, changing presidents won't do it if Ben Bernanke can't be fired by the president for policy reasons and, and his term exceeds that of the president. So how did they, what, is, what has happened to the framers' vision? The first step that everyone knows about, obviously, is that it was the creation of the, the fourth branch of government where they took away the SEC, the FCC, the FTC, the so-called independent agencies, and greatly reduced the president's ability to control them, mainly by saying he couldn't fire them for, for policy-related reasons. The court, in reaction to that, had, had been previously been pretty good in terms of preserving separation of powers, and to this day remains pretty good in terms of one kind of usurpation of the separation of powers. That's when the legislature takes over an executive function. If a legislative agent is performing an executive function, that's a direct combination of the legislative executive power, and the court is vigilant in striking that down. But the point I'd like to convey is that really doesn't happen a lot, number one, and is hardly a sufficient safeguarding of the separation of powers. Congress doesn't want to execute the law. It doesn't want to be in charge of making decisions because that imports accountability. Then they have to answer for decisions. When GM was being bailed out under a law called TARP that had absolutely nothing to do with car companies, no one in Congress wanted to step up and make the tough decision on whether or not GM should be bailed out. What they wanted to do was stand on the sidelines and if it went well, take credit. If it didn't go well, uh, blame that idiot Paulson who had made such a stupid uh, decision. And that, of course, is precisely the evil that you're worried about under separation of power, which is no accountability for important decisions. In addition, of course, Congress does, since nature and power abhor a vacuum, if these commissions are separated from the president, then they are much more susceptible to legislative influence. They're much more susceptible to the committee chairman who are responsible for whether they get confirmed and are ultimately in charge of the budget. So you've again realigned the power between the executive and the legislative branch. Notwithstanding all of that, this, this headless fourth branch that I described was upheld in the famous or infamous case of Humphrey's executor, which was largely assault on FDR's uh, uh, assertions of executive power and was done explicitly in the name of this is really a much better progressive view of, of government. We want people, neutral arbiters, who are scientifically analyzing these issues without politics, without 
the influence of you know the great unwashed who cling to religion and guns and are not capable of the rational decision making that this centralized power in Washington DC in a very value neutral way will, will work its way through. And that was, as I say, uh, accepted in this case of, uh, of hum Humphrey's executor. So now turning to the case that I argued last term, the Free Enterprise Foundation case, that went a step further. That, that created not only a fourth branch, but a fifth branch of government. In other words, it created an agency that was controlled by a fourth branch agency. The agency was called the PCAOB. It performed a very important function. Uh, it was in charge of all the outside auditing under Sarbanes-Oxley. It had enormous power to second-guess auditors. It even had the power to tax. It, could, it, it was a self-budgeting organization that funds itself by in, uh, putting a tax on all registered corporations in the United States. So it had this enormous power, but could, did the president exercise any control over people exercising enormous executive power? He couldn't hire them, he couldn't fire them, he couldn't review their budget, as I said, and he had no ability to look at their work product. So this was a step further than what the court had accepted in terms of the independent agencies, which after all the president does exercise some influence over because he does appoint them, and most importantly, in my mind, he gets to appoint and remove at will the chairman of the agencies, and that's, that's a very important uh, spot. So what the court did in Free Enterprise Foundation said, no, this is a step too far. It doesn't matter whether or not the SEC can control uh, this PCAOB because, of course, the SEC doesn't have any executive power. The president does. Moreover, the SEC's control over the PCAOB is limited because they can only remove these board members on uh, very narrow grounds. So the basic point of it was to say, you can't go any further than the fourth branch erected by Humphrey's executor. And I, I think it was a significant case for that reason, um, but it really didn't change the existing status quo. And so I'd like to briefly explain why I think, however, the Free Enterprise Fund case could be used to change the status quo and get us back to something along the lines of, of the original document. Basically, in, let me make the point first is I don't think Free Enterprise Foundation, uh, Free Enterprise Fund creates a, uh, an avenue for somebody to challenge an, an independent agency in a lawsuit. I don't think if you challenged uh, some regulation by the SEC that you'd get five votes in the current Supreme Court to uphold it. I think there'd be a lot of hand-wringing, at least among some of the justices, about overturning something that's been in existence for a long time and overruling Humphrey's executor. But what I do think you can accomplish the change, and I do think it would actually survive court challenge, is when the next president is elected, he can actually do this by himself. He can take self-help. He can fire the chairman of the SEC or the commissioner of the SEC and then dare the court to enter an injunction requiring him to take back uh, somebody who is exercising an extraordinarily important executive power. And I don't think that the court, particularly in those circumstances, would do it for two reasons. One is, and I'm not going to bore you too much with the quotes, but the way the Free Enterprise Fund was written by Chief Justice Roberts, enshrined in a majority opinion of the Supreme Court, the basic principles of the unitary executive I was talking about before, which is that the president has all the power, and for that reason, he needs to control people who are exercising it. And these quotes, while in the Federalist Papers for a long time, had never made their way into a Supreme Court opinion. And I'll just give you a couple that will, will basically make the point about how this case did re return to first principles. First, my favorite quote, as Madison stated on the floor of the first Congress, if any power whatsoever is in its nature executive, it is the power of appointing, overseeing, and controlling those who execute the laws. So now we know that a core executive power is the ability to control those who are exec uh, executing the law. They go on in this regard throughout the opinion that the president needs to have control of those who are subordinates. That's why we make a single president responsible for the actions of, this, uh, of the executive branch. Um, he can either he needs to be able to ensure that the laws are faithfully executed and be held and hold those who do it responsible. Um, and again, 
The reason for this is without a clear and effective chain of command, the public cannot determine on whom the blame or punishment of permission measures or series of permission measures ought really to fall. This is all about democratic accountability. And that is why the framers sought to ensure, and again, he's, they're quoting Madison, those who are employed in the execution of the law will be in their proper situation and the chain of dependence be preserved. The lowest officers, the middle grade, and the highest will depend, as they ought, on the president and the president on the community. So again, they, so the basic principles for a unitary executive are all set forth there. Interestingly, when they turned to Humphrey's executor, which obviously was inconsistent with that, the way they describe the holding of that case in the majority opinion is that it involved, they quote the part where it, they say that it involved quasi-legislative and quasi-adjudicatory functions. That what the, was the FTC was doing at the time of Humphrey's executor. So they no way endorsed the notion that people exercising executive power can be treated uh, in the way that um, the FTC commissioner was treated in Humphrey's executor. In other words, it wasn't a, they didn't confront the issue of whether or not the president's executive power was uh, violated in Humphrey's executor because they characterized the people at issue as non-executive actors. So that would, again, allow a predicate for a, a president so, so inclined to take away the SEC chairman saying that it disrupts the chain of command that the Supreme Court endorsed in this. And the final point I'll make on this is the dissenting opinion for utterly inexplicable reasons, uh, the four liberal justices, Justice Breyer made the point uh, that as a statutory matter, the SEC ch commissioner, commissioners are actually can be removed by the president at will, that there's nothing in the statute that protects them from at will removal, from being pawns of, of the president. Um, which is un probably wrong as a statutory matter, but of course I don't care because we now have nine justices saying either, as a, either giving you a constitutional rationale for firing the SEC, com uh, SEC commissioner or four justices saying, look, there's not even a statutory bar against you doing so. So when you vote for your next presidential candidate or when you attend any meetings in terms of selecting it, I think one of the first litmus tests is we want to impose on any candidate we support is this is guarantee that he will fire an independent agency commissioner and, and <laughs> within the first two months and then see if the Supreme Court is really going to invoke the Constitution to accomplish a, a design that is clearly contrary to any the text structure and history of that document. Thank you. All right, thank you. We're going to get a response from Doug Kendall, but then we're going to move directly to your questions. So if you have questions, please start approaching the microphone because we are a little pressed for time. Doug. Yeah, and I'll go very quickly. Um, I, I actually, um, and Mike and I debated this case before it was argued, and I, I don't disagree with his position. I think the Peekaboo Board was established in a very uh, odd way and I think that uh, I actually have a lot of sympathy for uh, Chief Justice Roberts opinion that uh, the board as constituted um, is a step too far. Um, I think what Mike's not telling you though is how much of this case he lost um, and how big the losses were versus the very very narrow win. Um, it, you know I think if you compare the opinion by uh, Brett Kavanaugh on the uh, D.C. Circuit to the opinion by Chief Justice Roberts. And if you um, look at the briefs filed in this case, which on Mike's side, which were asking for really sweeping changes, both in the law of removal as well as in the law of appointment, the appointment power, um, the court dismissed out of hand and unanimously the appointment power arguments. Um, and on the removal question, um, there is not a, uh, a word said whatsoever that disparages either Humphrey's executor or Morrison, even more, which I think is a, a surprise, frankly, to a lot of people uh, across the spectrum, that this opinion by Chief Justice Roberts doesn't even take on or disparage in a little way a, a case that's really been the bet nor of the uh, of the right for a long time. And so, and you know, the end outcome of the case 
was to enforce Humphrey's executor. They edited the statute to keep a four-cause provision in, you know, a single four-cause provision in effect. That's a really odd way if you're going out to start a revolution on removal law. It's a really odd way to not say anything disparaging about e any of the cases that hold it and enforce as a matter of remedy uh, a Humphrey's executor remedy. So I think, I, I think the most interesting thing about Free Enterprise Fund is how narrow the opinion ultimately turned out to be and how little the court's majority said about or how, you know, how resounding the idea or how resounding the fourth branch uh, was affirmed in the, in the majority's opinion. All right. Thank you. Let's go right to questions. Uh, my name is Ray Lajeunesse. I'm legal director for the National Right to Work Legal Defense Foundation. As such, I'm a plaintiff's lawyer. Uh, representing non-union workers who don't want to be forced into unions. And my question is concerning arbitration. I don't think Mike Carvin's response to Mr. Vance was responsive. Mr. Vance was talking about the situation, not where two parties who have a dispute agree to go to arbitration, but where in an unequal bargaining situation, an employer says to a prospective employee, you must sign this contract to arbitrate or you won't get the job. The situ situation is even worse after the Supreme Court's decision in 14 Penn Plaza, where the court said a union representing all of the workers in the bargaining unit could wave away the rights of every individual in that bargaining unit, including non-members. Uh, Ryan, Ryan, thank you. Uh, for what, your... what is your response to that point? Oh, I'm sorry. Well, no, I'll say ahead. this briefly. Ray, you said it better than I could have, but, <laughs> you know, I, I have no problem with, you know, two corporate uh, clients deciding they want to put in a 10-page arbitration agreement and their attorneys drawing them up and everybody signing off on it. Uh, the circumstance I told you about with my grandmother, when I asked the nursing home to remove it, they said, wow. We've never had anybody even notice it. We've never had anyone ask to remove it. And they did, in fact, remove it. And my grandmother, who, you know, she can barely read. She's never driven a car before in her life. Would have no idea what she was signing but for us looking at it. Uh, well, obviously, you need to distinguish between a union waving away somebody else's rights and somebody else voluntarily deciding that they'd, they'd prefer arbitration. I don't think any individual, whether a union member, union chief or not, should be able to bargain away anybody else's rights. So the two are not remotely comparable. In terms of unequal bargaining power, you know, we hear this all the time, that because employers and corporations are so powerful, the, the people are just not able to exercise their autonomy and therefore we're not going to allow them to exercise their autonomy in the name of preserving their autonomy. It doesn't strike me as particularly logical because, I mean, yeah, the employer is going to say what he's going to say with respect to his position on arbitration, just like he's going to say with respect to how many hours you're going to work and what salary you're going to get paid. The notion that you can't exercise the same self-autonomy to reject his salary offer as you are on whether or not you sign up for arbitration strikes me as quite odd. You can go to another employer and do it. I don't think that there's monopolist employers throughout the United States. And by the way, the notion that this is somehow unfair to employees always strikes me as un particularly odd. I don't know that arbitrators have a pro-employer bias in, in the employment context. I actually, not in my experience at all. In terms of the consumer class action context, Normally, these disputes are about $25 items or some kind of, nobody would ever go to court to, to vindicate their individual rights in those circumstances. So what arbitration does, like the, the case in front of the court now, where the district court described it as the fairest arbitration procedure you'd ever seen in terms of what AT&T granted to its consumers, was gives you uh, attorney's fees, uh, guaranteed $7,500 award if you lose, extraordinarily generous. And everyone, I would think, individually would say that's a much better system for me than, than just waiting five years to uh, get it decided in some civil jury system. All right, next question. Uh, Mr. Vance, I, I guess I share your concern that uh, the federal courts don't really provide much in the way of civil jury trials anymore. Compared to the 1960s with more judges and more cases, we have many few cases going to trial in the federal courts today than then. And the civil litigators I know tell me that the reason for that is that civil litigation, there's nothing wrong with people settling their cases, but, but uh, people tell me that the reason why that is the case is that civil discovery and the civil litigation process have just become way too expensive, that people cannot 
exercise their Seventh Amendment right. I'm wondering if your organization has any suggestions for reducing the costs associated with civil litigation. You know, that's a very interesting point. It's a tough issue because both sides obviously should have the right to have experts if they're required and go through all the formal discovery steps that you need to to prepare for trial. So we don't have an answer for that. But, but the question is, is very pertinent and it is a problem. Uh, you know, but there are artificial boundaries uh, to ever getting in front of, of that jury. And just quickly to respond to something Mike uh, said about preemption. Uh, preemption is real. It, preemption is tort reform. Preemption is uh, a way to, to stop someone from getting in front of a jury. We represent hundreds of people that have pacemakers uh, in their chest that every so often they just go off and shock them. And because of the Regal decision, I don't know if preemption is tort reform or not, but they have no remedy. So I, that's not a direct answer to your question, but you have defined the problem. State courts try lots of civil cases. Uh, and we try to stay there as much as we can. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Roger. I'm Roger Pilon, Cato Institute. Uh, for Mike Carvin, uh, I think you're absolutely right on your points about preemption. This is not a Seventh Amendment issue, and all we need to do is look at a case like uh, Wyeth v. Levine to see how justice can go awry. If the Commerce Clause was meant for anything, it was meant to ensure the free flow of goods and services among the states, and jury trials can really make a mess of that if uh, pharmaceutical companies, for example, have to have 50 different labels for warnings on their uh, medications. But I want to ask you about your administrative law side of things. You made much of the, uh, the fact that you've got three functions in a single uh, hand, namely uh, legislative, executive, and judicial, as we have so often in administrative agencies today. And so can anything really be done about this until we come to grips with the demise of the, uh, of the uh, intelligible principle uh, doctrine and uh, the, uh, the uh, non-delegation doctrine that flowed from that demise? Yeah, Roger, I, I view that more as exacerbating severely the problems I talked about for, I assume everybody in the audience is familiar with the notion, and obviously it happens all the time, much more these days. The law says, do good, act in the public interest, and leaves extraordinary amounts of powers and discretion to uh, agencies without any kind of real check. Uh, and there used to be a doctrine that said, look, Legislating is a congressional power. It is not an executive power. So you can't just give agencies an ink blot and say, go do good. You need to provide them with much more definite guidance about what is good and what is bad and, and, and what they've got to do. Roger, I view them as first cousins of each other, and I would think that a revived delegation doctrine, which unfortunately I see no uh, impetus on the current court for, would be a huge check. It would actually be the twin to what uh, Lillian was talking right. about in terms of the single object rule. What we want to do is make sure that there can't be this cloud of obfuscation. We want legislatures to step to the plate and say, I am in favor of X and against Y, not punt it down the road to a bunch of administrators when there's never any democratic check down, down the road. So it to me is very important both in terms of legislative and executive accountability that everybody knows what the rules of the road is and they're not made up in an ad hoc uh, fashion. Did you want to chime in? No, I, I agree with that completely and the only reason I didn't talk about non-delegation was because I decided to sort of avoid things that the court was going to sort of implement by way of structural change because I just thought maybe if we looked at this Congress and ho had hopes for them and some of the things might, might work to make it more accountable. All right, thanks. Next question. Uh, Ilya Selman, George Mason Law School. This is a question for Mr. Carvin. Obviously, <laughs> the big elephant in the uh, closet of the unitary executive is the question of the Federal Reserve. So I sort of, I sort of it, it, if I can be indulgent, a two-part question about this. One is, does your argument about the uh, unitary executive imply that the current uh, structure of the Federal Reserve is unconstitutional insofar as that if the President disagrees with Ben Bernanke's policies, he can't uh, fire Ben Bernanke before his term is over. And second, what you said about a President uh, taking power and then firing an independent agency head and sort of daring the court 
uh, to, to do something about it without apply to the Federal Reserve. So for instance, you have someone who holds my view that Ben Bernanke has been doing a bad job, becomes president uh, after the next election, could that person say, okay, Ben, you're gone, uh, and if the court wants to do something about it, I dare you to enter an injunction. Uh, and if this argument doesn't apply to the Federal Reserve, then sort of what's the distinction between the Federal Reserve and the SEC or some other agency? Thank you. Yeah. No, I wasn't implying it. I was saying it. Yeah, no, he should be able to fire. Uh, <laughs> he, 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 he should definitely be able to fire Bernanke. Now, in fairness, I would say it's a bit more uh, ambiguous as to whether or not the Fed is exercising an executive power than the SEC, FCC, FTC, all of which engage in literally law enforcement, you know, in, in uh, enforcement actions as well as, as rulemaking. There's a very complicated historical argument that since, they're, since the Fed is doing bank-like things, and uh, uh, whether or not Congress has the power of purse, you could make an intellectually respectable, ultimately unpersuasive argument that what, what Bernanke's not what Bernanke's doing is not an executive function that the president needs to control. But no, I don't buy it, and I would certainly apply it to him. And it's obviously a, a huge function, right? All right. Um, we're going to have to uh, call it a day. I'm sorry we are out of time, and I apologize for leaving people stranded at the microphone. Let's thank the panel.